the ancient mysteries do hold basis in truth. Pagan cultures, planetary wide, once worshipped a winged snake, the feathered serpent, sentinel of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The antediluvian world exalted these mystical wyverns, revering them across nations as the feathered serpent, the flying fiery phoenix. Foremost of these pagan deities is Lucifer, the Shining One, Keeper of Secrets and Premier Archangel, the Cardinal Sphinx. He is known to Christians as the Genesis 3 Nakash, Master Magician and Chameleon Enchanter, Leader of the War in Heaven and Ephesians 6 Powers, Principalities, Rulers of Darkness, cast out of heaven so long ago. He and his host have, are nothing more than mere angels in indeterminate guise. And yet for a short time, these seraphic angels purged from the celestial hierarchy would establish themselves predominant over a reprobate earth, disrupting the natural cycle of humanity's resolve, parading themselves as gods. Evil intentions govern the symbiotic relationship of pagan peoples with these so-called gods, the worship of which, from instillment, was imbued with demand for virgin, victim, blood, or child sacrifice. Modern Satanism and current piety reflect similar accord. What does that say about these ancient dragons, these mythical denizens still ruling from behind the scenes as mighty Oz? Most of humanity are still enslaved to such interpretation. The matrix now ancient in subjection is wrapped firmly in the talons of that great dragon, that old serpent known as Satan and the devil, he who deceiveth the entirety of the world. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is FallenAngels.tv. And I thank you for joining me today for um, another show on this particular topic as still I am receiving email questions about it and um, from people that are trying to get clarity that don't understand the prior time and that believe still in a young earth and don't understand the the gap as far as um Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 and Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 and how the earth became null and void and how the following chapters speak of the recreation of it um, for what would become the foundation for the current age the second world age and the presence of modern humanity here upon the planet as well as the um, because it was during this age that the fall of the watchers also took place during the lifetime of Yared uh, which means descend and it was during his lifetime that they that these holy angels, because they were holy angels before their fall, um, they left their place of habitation. They abandoned their first estate and coming here were placed into human flesh, were transformed into human flesh and that gave them the capacity to mate with the daughters of Cain and 
the result of this unholy union, this unholy matrimony, was the creation of a race of hybrid giants. And they are mentioned in Genesis 6 as the men of renown, and these particular beings, uh, they became cannibals. They had such large appetites and forcing humans to be servile to them when they weren't able to bring them all the food and all the uh, goods they required to stay, um, you know, to um, appease their voracious appetites they then began to consume their servants. And in that way, they found that they had a taste for human flesh as well as the blood of humanity. And from that time onward, they instituted into the religions, the various pagan religions, which... um, became indoctrinated to the worship of their fathers, the rebel angels, uh, and the fallen watchers, um, those religions embraced and established ritual which required the victim child sacrifice and the consummation of blood and as well as human flesh. And so anyways, that was the reason why I uh, opened with the poem that I did. All right, and so I'm going to begin the show with a question, and I have a couple that I'm going to explain and touch upon today in order to set the premise for what we will be speaking about Um Hello, Matthew. Good to good to see you. Welcome, Link, and Heaven, and all the other guests and those that will join us later. Um, this definitely seems to be a, po- a topic of interest, and it was to me as well when I first began to study these scriptures. I was intrigued by the revelation of Genesis 6. You know, the sons of God mating with the daughters of man uh, and the creation of a race of giants and that there were giants on the earth before and after the flood. All of that really intrigued me. And that was one of the reasons why I began to study and to read all the extra biblical and extra canonical texts uh, in the way that I have over the past several decades and it was also the interest in the giants and I wanted to know more about that angle of the scriptures and so I studied everything and found that uh, indeed the Old Testament is full of accounts of the wars of the Hebrew peoples, the Israelites, against this demon seed. And so that propelled my study of all of these texts and of which I've spent the last um, seven years here on Blog Talk Radio since 2008 sharing many of these texts, at least the most relevant parts, so that you can benefit from my discovery of certain passages, certain scriptures, which elaborate on this mysterious aspect of the scriptures. And I would most definitely recommend, if people have not already, Um, the study of the book of Enoch because it gives 
the most elaboration one can find in any text as to the fall of the watchers and so and uh what exactly they did to bring on the wrath of the most high god that found them excluded from the possibility of being saved and granted eternal life even though they already had eternal life they will be forced to surrender and will no longer um, find themselves once judgment ensues with the second coming of Yeshua uh, they will find themselves eradicated as if they had never been and so I'm going to share with you the question and then we'll go into some of the scriptures that help me to understand this story more and more okay uh, Trey sent me an email just yesterday, or maybe it was today. And he said that he's heard me talk about these topics on John's show at Tribulation-Now, uh, which also I, I will be a guest tomorrow evening um, from 9.30 to 11 on his show and we'll be talking about some of these things um, in connection with my sixth book Sons of God and so do join us there if you can alright he asked um, or, or said I have read some pages on Skyfall and it's very eye opening I wanted to ask so, so that I am clear about this the Seraphim was the serpent in the garden question mark the nephilim are the fallen angels that mated with earth women and the rephaim I, I guess i'm spelling this right are the giants and offspring of the nephilim and thus demons are the disembodied spirits of the rephaim or giants and uh, if you could please give me clarity um and a good understanding of this i would greatly appreciate it and so um, I'm going to explain this story as well as elaborate on these terms uh, because it, there's some confusion surrounding them. Um, first, most people, when they speak about the Nephilim, they equate the Nephilim to be the giants um, because there's um, a definition uh, of earthborn, uh, I believe it's the Greek translation of um, gigantis, and some people connect the uh, Nephilim with being the earthborn, or uh, those that are, you know, found here, locked here, uh, imprisoned here to the earth. But that's not how I see it. Um, and it's my opinion that the Nephilim are actually the 200 watchers that left their place of habitation, which it talks about this also in Jude, which we'll go there uh, after I explain this particular story. But let me um, read the email that I sent back in reply. And uh, this is pretty precise, and so this will help people. And this will lay the foundation for where we're going to be going as well uh, in this particular show. I said, you're correct on everything except for one thing. The serpent in the garden was called the Nakash, which means shining one, magician, or enchanter. If you look to Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28, you see that it was Lucifer who was in paradise with Adam and Eve prior to their fall from grace. 
uh, he is referred to as a cherubim. In the Gnostic text, it speaks about Yaldabaoth, which means child passed through here, um, in which Sophia, who is, um, her name means wisdom, Sophia is the mother, uh, according to this Gnostic text, that gave or brought into being um, the physical embodiment of who Lucifer um, took hold of or the serpent form, his serpentine form. Um, also called Samael, the angel of death, and Sakla, which means blind god. He was a cherubim that fell and was transformed into a dark entity. The, it speaks about this in, um, in the first book of Adam and Eve, which talks about their fall from paradise and their banishment here to the earth where the rebel angels had already been bound. He is the same Lucifer whom, when he was cast out of heaven, took the name Satan. Satan, which means adversary. And so the serpent in the garden was a cherubim who was cast out. The seraphim are the dragon-like angels which joined him in rebellion and were also cast out with him after the war in heaven. The watcher angels are the ones that fell during the time of Yared, which again, I said Yared is Enoch's father and his name means descend. Uh, were holy angels that were transformed into flesh given men's bodies. Refer to Kebra Nagas chapter 100 for more details on this transformation. Because they were transformed into human flesh, they lusted after and were able to mate with the daughters of man, the daughters of Cain specifically. However, this resulted in an unnatural birth since it was not a holy union. Uh, these are where the Rephaim, uh, which the Rephaim are the giants, where they come from and how they enter the story. Um, for more detail, I did a previous two-part series just not long ago on the two incursions of angels, which people can go and listen to to get further elaboration on what I'm talking about here. You can find those posted on my YouTube channel under Endeavor Freedom, which is my YouTube name, Endeavor Freedom. E-N-D-E-A-V-O-R-F-R-E-E-D-O-M. All right. So... Um, that was a reply, and that's, that will set the basis for, I'll read just a few passages, because I told you I would give you the, the actual scriptures which detail this, and the ones that you may not be familiar with, and I'm, you know, I'm not going to um, go to Genesis 6, because most of you are familiar with that passage. If you're not, do go there. Genesis 6. Uh, verses 1 through 5 will is where you can find in the Old Testament um, the mention of this story. And as I said, the war in heaven and the banishment of the rebel angels, um, you can find more of that detail of that story in chapter 29 and 30 of the secrets of Enoch, which is second Enoch, the book of the secrets of Enoch, chapter 29 and 30. Uh, it makes mention of the rebel angels being cast out of the heavens on the second day. And so um, look there because that story is connected to the, the gap between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. And the judgment against the rebel angels um, is what led to the earth becoming null and void and then 
the next parts being the recreation of the earth um, for preparation for the creation of modern humanity and the fall of Adam and Eve and then their later placement after they were banished from paradise, their placement here upon the earth. All right. So let's look to Jude chapter 1 first. Because that's a, one of the places in the New Testament where Jude speaks about this particular story and he links this story to the... Um, he references Enoch chapter 2 verse 1 which I'll, when we get there, I'll, I'll mention it. But he's tying this particular story to that particular text so that um, he, so that those of you that are interested in learning more will go there to get greater detail. And this was not possible prior to, I think it was 1773, that the book of Enoch was rediscovered by James Bruce in the Ethiopian canon, and he reintroduced uh, this text to the then Western Christian world. But that prior to then, uh, for who knows how long, uh, the sons of Cain have been successful in eradicating this text from the Western world the Western Christian world, and so the story was forgotten. And one of the reasons why it was stripped from canon in the first place was because uh, there was a debate over whether the sons of God mentioned in Genesis chapter 6, whether they were angels or just the sons of Seth. And, you know, the... Again, the Council of Nicaea was, in my opinion, um, instrumental in hiding the truth and keeping, in, de stripping away much of the story which would give you greater understanding on this. And that, that um, because they didn't want, you know, humanity to know about the fall of the angels, as well as their connection to the lineage of Cain, um, those kinds of texts, those which elaborated on this story, were stripped from canon and not included when they had been, um, you know, prior to the coming of that council. Like in Ethiopia, the canon which found its way um, to Ethiopia with the Queen of Sheba and then later with, um, I believe it, her son's name was Malik, when he went to go visit his father, man, uh, father King Solomon, uh, and then the ark went with them, uh, the Most High, because Solomon became involved with um, pagan women and began to worship the, the fallen angels. Um, the angels of the Most High helped the firstborn sons of the the kings and the leaders uh, and even the high priest of Solomon's kingdom, they left with Malak, um, the son of Solomon, and went to Ethiopia, and they took the Ark of the Covenant with them. You can get um, great detail on this in the book called the Glory of Kings, which is um, the Kebra Nagath, which I'm going to mention, I'm going to read from chapter 100 here in just a little bit, because it also gives detail on this particular story. But I want to start with the scriptures as you know, far as our own canon, as we have it, um, to show you that this story is mentioned and preserved there. All right. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and just
skip down to verse number five. He says, um, Jude says, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. And yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam, for reward and perish in the game saying of Corey. These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about on winds. Trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out of their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch, also the seventh from Adam, prophesies of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed in all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Uh, these, murmur, these are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust and their mouth, Speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. All right, I'm going to stop there and highlight just a couple passages. Uh, the verse 14 and 15, that is almost, it, it paraphrases um, Enoch chapter 2, verse 1, again, which is Jude's way of linking this story about the fall of the watchers, the angels that kept not their first estate, to the book of Enoch. Because it's in that text where we get greater detail as to what happened, how it happened, and how it is that they were condemned and judged for what then did happen. Also notice that in verse 6, or verse 7, it mentions... Sodom and Gomorrah. And remember in the series that I did on the writings of Abraham, where it talked about how the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah, how they raped those that visit their cities, that they would take them and bring them before all the people of the city and allow whoever wanted to come and um, have sex with them against their will and that they were tied down uh, against their will so that these these rapes could take place against them and how they would not feed the visitors to their city and they would allow them to starve to death as well as they would steal their goods and the giants you know that were um that the they were the inhabitants, there were many giants that lived among the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and they were bisexual in nature. They did not have any problem at all in, um, in, you know, in committing homosexual acts. And the families, the people there, they offered up their wives and their daughters to others, um, and 
you know, celebrate a certain holidays, some pag- certain pagan festivities in orgies, um, in huge orgies. And so um, if you want to know more about that, just go to the series that I did on the writings of Abraham, which detail that. But also notice that Jude says here, and going after strange flesh. The book of giants in the Dead Sea Scrolls speaks about the miscegenation of the creatures, of the animals, um, by the giants, and how hybrids were created from their fornication with these different animals. And that, you know, that's how we had centaurs being born, half man, half horse, um, Minotaur, the bull-headed man, uh, things uh, of that kind of weird nature came about from them going after strange flesh. And so let's go to the book of Enoch. Now, I'll check the chat room here in just a few minutes. Uh, if you have any questions, place them there. But we're going to go to Enoch chapter 7. This is from one Enoch, the book of Enoch. He says, and this this particular chapter is um, similar to the Genesis 6 account about the sons of God mating with the daughters of man. It says this, It happened after the sons of men had multiplied in those days that daughters were born to them, elegant and beautiful. And when the angels, now notice that it's not the sons of Seth, it's the angels. When the angels, the sons of heaven, beheld them, they became enamored of them, saying to each other, Come, let us select for ourselves wives from the progeny of men, and let us beget children. Then their leader, Samyaza, who is the angel that is mentioned in the book of Giants, um, as having born two sons, Maha, Mahe and Ohe, Ohe, as well as Gilgamesh is mentioned in that particular text as well. And um, those of you that are familiar with the Sumerian teachings, the mythology of the, the Sumerian teachings, Gilgamesh was partially divine and, and but born of an earth mother. And he was seeking after immortality. Well, that lets you know that the Sumerian gods and those that they revere are the same giants that were born from the fallen watchers as described here in the book of Enoch and that the Anunnaki are nothing more than the uh, rebel angels as well as the fallen angels, the fallen watchers. All right, Enoch 7, 3. Then their leader, Samyaza, said to them, I fear that you may perhaps be indisposed to the performance of this enterprise and that I alone shall suffer for so grievous a crime. See, they knew that they were about to commit a huge, unpardonable sin. But they answered him and said, We all swear and bind ourselves but mutual excrucations that we will not change our intention, but execute our projected undertaking. Then they all, then they swore all together and bound themselves by mutual exhortations. Their whole number was 200 who descended upon Ardis, which is the top of Mount Ermon. That mountain, therefore, was called Armon because they had sworn upon it and bound themselves by mutual exarchation. Uh, and Ermon, or Harem, though from the word Hebrew word Aram, H-E-R-E-M, means a curse. All right, let's continue. I want to read two chapters from this, uh, back-to-back from this book of Enoch, because it will set the groundwork for the other stuff I want to get into. These are the names of their chiefs. Samyaza, who was their leader, Urakabaranel, 
Akabel, Tamiel, Ramuel, Danel, Ak- Askiel, Ser- no, I don't have to read all that. These were the prefects of the 200 angels, and the remainder were all with them. Then they took wives, each choosing for himself whom they began to approach and with whom they cohabitated, teaching them sorcery, incantations, and the dividing of roots and trees. And the women conceiving brought forth giants, whose stature was each 300 cubits. These devoured all which the labor of men produced until it became impossible to feed them. When they turned themselves against men in order to devour them and began to injure birds, beasts, reptiles, and fishes to eat their flesh one after another and to drink their blood, then the earth reproved the unrighteous. All right. Uh, Before I go into the next chapter... I want to um, go to the Kebra Nagas. All right, um, let me give you the link. For those that might want to follow along or read more detail of this particular story, you can go there. Hello, Ren. Good to see you, sister. And I'll get to the comments in the chat room here after I read this particular portion of the text. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but if you read the whole thing, basically it tells you the story of how the holy watchers were jealous of Yeshua, um, his love of Adam and how Adam had been created in the image of Christ, and how the holy angels, the watchers, how they were servants uh, to Christ, and how they challenged him to place them into flesh, um, because they talked about, they were basically tattletales, and they told on Adam uh, his eating fruit from the, Tree of the Knowledge of Good and Evil, basically him and Eve, uh, they're wanting to be as gods themselves, and Eve's beguilement in that she um, had sex with Lucifer, and then Adam repeated the act with his wife, and that's where Cain and Abel uh, consequentially were born from both the conception of Satan and Eve, and then Adam and Eve. And that's why Cain and uh, Abel were from different fathers and the firstborn of the different bloodlines. All right. And so anyways, uh, you can read about how they were put into human flesh, but I'll, I'll pick up the story right there. It says, and straightway they were given unto them with his word flesh and blood and a heart of the children of men. And they were content to leave the height of heaven, and they came down to earth to the folly of the dancing of the children of Cain with all their work of the artisan, which they had made in the folly of their fornication, and to their scenes which they accompanied with the tambourine and the flutes and the pipes and much shouting and loud cries of joy and noisy songs. And their daughters were there and they enjoyed the orgies without shame for they scented themselves for the men who pleased them and they lost the balance in their minds. And the men did not restrain themselves for a moment, but they took the wife from among the women, those whom they had chosen and committed sin with them. For God hath no resting place in the hearts of the arrogant and those who revile, but he abideth in the hearts of the humble and those who are sincere. All right, um, continuing with this story. And then straightway God was wroth with them, 
and he bound them in the terror of Sheol until the day of redemption, as the apostle said. He treated his angels with severity. He spared them not, but made them to dwell in a state of judgment, and they were fettered until the great day. The word of God conquered, and again, that's Christ, the word of God, who hath fashioned Adam. Remember, we were made in his image, so it was Christ, Yeshua, that made Adam. Um, in his likeness or form, and those who had reviled and made a lapping stock of Adam were conquered, that's the watchers, and the daughters of Cain, with whom the angels had accompanied or had accompanied, conceived, but they were unable to bring forth their children, and they died. And of the children who were in their womb, some died and some came forth, having split open the bellies of their mothers, they came forth by their navels. And when they were grown up and reached man's estate, they became giants whose height reached unto the clouds. And so there you see, um, you know, greater detail, the story of how the watchers were put into flesh bodies, into male form, and how they... Um, were attracted to the daughters of Cain, took them for wives, and then uh, conceiving with them, because they were both spirit and flesh, they did not have normal human children, but gave birth to giants. And these giants did not just, you know, they weren't born naturally, but they came up through the bellies of their mothers. They split their navels and then, you know, basically ripped their mothers in half as they came forth from their bodies. All right. Keep this story in mind. All right, let me just go ahead and check the chat room. Um, I'm just looking to make sure, see if there's any relevant comments that I could share. All right, just some comments about the the particular test. Uh, Matthew asks, how did other people exist where Cain went? When, because uh, he was exiled to the land of Nod. Well, you have to remember again that the rebel angels, which were banished from the heavens before the modern creation of humanity, there had there had already been pre-existent, pre-Adamic humanity here upon the planet, and that the rebel angels, in trying to create a slave race. Not only did they experiment, do genetic experiment, experimentation on these particular beings and how these particular beings were, um, they were m much like Bigfoot. Let me see if I can pull up something real quick that would give you more detail on that. But um, in my book, Sons of God, my sixth book, I describe how the the being that they tried to create a slave race out of, how this particular being was a Bigfoot type of creature, that the pre adamic humans were, you know, basically like Bigfoot, and that uh, it was these beings that they began to work with and to try to shape and... Um, that turned the, and they were successful to a certain degree in creating what would look like a modern almost like a modern human not like Adam because Adam was you know created in the image of uh, Yeshua but they had succeeded somewhat in 
creating a being that was similar to uh, to a, a human form that took on the image of them, of the Anunnaki. All right. Well, anyways, I, I can't find the, the text, which... So if you want to know more about that, just go to Sons of God, because I elaborate in great detail uh, on that story, which um, brings me to another question that somebody had asked me. And let me see if I can answer this in a quick fashion. She says, uh, I wanted to ask a few questions. This is Lachelle. And I actually have to apologize to her because I forgot about her question uh, for a while, and so I'm just now getting to them. Wanted to ask a few questions to you by way of email. However, I was unable to find your email address. Um, In Genesis, when Yahweh created man in his own image, my understanding is that we were not made of flesh dirt. I've heard... Um, when Adam and Eve were deceived in the garden, Lucifer created forms in the image of man and woman. Adam and Eve, which he could see their images in water from heaven. Um, You won't know what she's talking about here, but I explain this, all of this in great detail in my book, Sons of God, as well. The bodies had no spirits. When Adam and Eve fell from grace, their spirit cells were placed in the form of the bodies that Lucifer had made. Uh, So my question here is, there's an ingredient missing somewhere along the lines here. How did Adam and Eve go from spirit to bodies? Who created the dirt bodies? Uh, Next question, how can man, um, as entity, have telepathic abilities when I was told that only Yahweh can read your mind? All right. I talk about this story, and and this is based on the Gnostic account. In the Gnostic account, it talks about how uh, Yaldabaoth, who, again, is the um, Satan, the the fallen cherub, how in order to um, compel Yeshua, because they saw the fallen angels that were here living on the earth, they saw an image, it, the story says, of the heavenly man. Other stories talk about the um, that they saw a reflection of Sophia in the waters, which would make you know a heavenly a heavenly woman. Anyways, they um, they talked amongst themselves the best way that they could lure the heavenly man or the heavenly woman down to the earth and have them live here upon the earth with them so that they can then rape, you know, to to basically um, take over, possess these forms, and to use them in the w- whatever way they wanted to, sexually and, and other, you know, other ways. And so the story speaks about that um, Yeshua sent his angel to Yaldabaoth and to the other rebel angels and instructed them in how to create what was called a mud form. Uh, in the text, it speaks about this mud form and how these this mud form it was going to um, serve as the physical container for what would be the spirit. Because um, Lucifer did, you know, they can't, create life. Only Yeshua, the Father, only they can create life and animate an you know an inorganic object, um, give it life or to place life within it. Just like with in the story in Genesis it speaks about how our bodies were made from the dust and that the spirit of life was blown into that um that flesh form. Well, in the Gnostic story, it talks about the the bodies that the dust form, the our dust bodies, came about as a um, as an agreement between both the holy angels as well as the fallen angels. 
that the fallen angels were instructed how to create this um, this flesh body, and that the there were I think over 360 angels. It mentions this in in Gnostic texts of all these different angels that worked on the creation of the the body, uh, the model form, which would contain our spirits, um, and that. Um, and that this this form stayed motionless upon the earth for 40 days. talks about this in 40 days. And then after the fall of Adam and Eve, when they were wanting to be as gods themselves, they fell from grace. They lost their immortal bright nature. On the sixth day, they were cast out of the heavens. Uh, and then on the eighth day, they were recreated or they were married, their spirits were entered into these flesh forms, uh, this, these modeled forms. And then, according to the story in the Gnostic text, Adam was, he, when he came to awareness, he found that he was in a fallen state and, and that he was living among these devils, among these demons. And he refers to them uh, as the God that created us. But he doesn't realize that um, his spirit, you know, that God, uh, that the fallen angels were not the gods that had created him, that he, you know, he was created in Yeshua's image, but that um, their, his fallen body, they had a part to play in its creation. And so he found himself being surrounded by these devils and demons. And then Sophia sent her, her daughter named Zoe, which means life, um, sent Zoe to him to instruct him on where he had fallen from. And then when the rebel angels tried to ensnare her and to rape her form, they succeeded in raping her form, but she left the body to, you know, to them to do as they wished. And then after uh, they raped this particular model form, then Eve was married to it, uh, and in her spirit entered into this model form. And then after that, she conceived Cain. And um, because it was here upon the earth, that she was, you know, basically beguiled, raped, and impregnated. And it was here on the earth that Cain and Abel um, would be born. And that the enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, all of that would unfold here upon the, the planet, in the Garden of Eden, the Cave of Treasures, because that's where they were banished to. They were banished to the cave of treasures. They had fallen from paradise, which paradise, if you read any account of the various patriarchs that were taken up through the ten heavens, such as the second book of Enoch, which is, uh, uh, details his trip through the ten heavens, the ascension of Isaiah, Isaiah's trip through the ten heavens, the vision of Paul, Paul's trip through the Ten Heavens, all of them speak about paradise being located at the third heaven, and that this is where the city of New Jerusalem, as the city of Enoch, uh, is currently located, and that the patriarchs, the early Hebraic patriarchs, um, as well as uh, the, the the females, those of the that are righteous of both genders are found, they are residing there in the city of Enoch currently. And that New Jerusalem will descend from the heavens and it will come here to the earth and that the uh, it will be relocated to the earth during the thousand year millennial reign as spoken about in Revelation 19 through 21. All right, and so I'm going to now go back to the story in the book of Enoch. I want to pick up with 
chapter 8. It says this. Enoch. Moreover, Azazel taught men to make swords, knives, shields, breastplates, the fabrication of mirrors and the workmanship of bracelets and ornaments, the use of paint, the beautifying of eyebrows, the use of stones of every valuable and select kind and all sorts of dyes so that the world became altered. Impiety increased, fornication multiplied, and they transgressed and corrupted all their ways. Amazara taught all the sorcerers and dividers of roots. Armors taught the solution of sorcery. Barakariel taught the observers of the stars. Akabel taught signs. Tamiel taught astronomy. And Azardel taught the motion of the moon. And men being destroyed cried out, and their voice reached to heaven. Now, um, this is where prior to the flood of Noah's day, the Most High um, told Enoch, as well as Noah and those um, Lamech and Mahalel, the patriarchs before Noah, uh, Lamech was uh, his father and Mahalel his grandfather. But anyways, he told them that he was going to bring a flood upon the earth to wipe out this abominable seed line and that the flood was essentially sent to eradicate the giants, which had multiplied in such numbers that violence and bloodshed and you know, humanity stood no chance. And they were eating, cannibalizing humanity as well. And so, um, as it says in Matthew 24, you know, um, if the days were not shortened, there should be no flesh left because the giants would have consumed all of them and then consumed themselves because they were already warring against each other as well. And so um, Yeshua sent Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael, Suriel, and Uriel down to the earth to investigate what was going on. And so we'll, we'll pick this up, Enoch chapter 9. It says, and then Michael and Gabriel, Raphael, Suriel, and Uriel looked down from heaven and saw the quantity of blood which was shed on earth and all the iniquity which was done upon it and said one to another, It is the voice of their cry. The earth deprived of her children has cried even to the gate of heaven. And now to you, O you holy one of heaven, the souls of men complain, saying, Obtain justice for us with the Most High. Then they said to their Lord, the King, You are Lord of Lord, God of God, King of kings, the throne of your glory is forever and ever, and forever and ever. And is your name sanctified and glorified? You are blessed and glorified. You have made all things. You possess power over all things, and all things are open and manifested for you. You behold all things, and nothing can be concealed from you. You have seen what Azazel has done, how he has taught every species of iniquity upon earth and has disclosed the world all the secret things which are done in the heaven. Samyaza also has taught sorcery to whom you have given authority over those who are associated with him. They have gone together to the daughters of men, have lain with them, have become polluted, and have discovered crimes to them. The women likewise have brought forth giants. Thus has the whole earth been filled with blood and with iniquity. And now behold, the sons, souls of those who are dead cry out and complain even to the gate of heaven. Their groaning ascends, nor can they escape from the unrighteous, which is committed on earth. You know all things before they exist. You know these things and what has been done by them, yet you do not speak to us. What on account of these things ought we to do with them? Chapter 10. Then the Most High, the Great and Holy One, spoke, and he sent Arsa 
Yalir to the son of Lamech, saying, Say to him my name, conceal yourself. Then explain to him the consummation which is about to take place. For all the earth shall perish. The waters of a deluge shall come over the whole earth, and all things which are in it shall be destroyed. And now teach him how he may escape and how his seed may remain in all the earth. Again the Lord said to Raphael, Bond, Bind Azazel hand and foot, cast him into darkness, and opening the de desert which is in Dudael, cast him in there. Throw upon him hurled and pointed stone, covering him with darkness. There shall he remain forever. Cover his face that he may not see the light. And in the great day of judgment, let him be cast into the fire. Restore the earth which the angels have corrupted and announce life to it that I may revive it. All the sons of men shall not perish in consequence of every secret by which the watchers have destroyed and which they have taught their offspring. All the earth has been corrupted by the effects of the teachings of Azazel. To him, therefore, ascribe the whole crime. To Gabriel, also the Lord said, Go to the biters, the reprobates, to the children of fornication, and destroy the children of fornication, the offspring of the watchers. From among men, bring them forth and excite them one against another. Let them perish by mutual slaughter, for length of days shall not be theirs. They shall all entreat you, but their fathers shall not obtain their wishes. Respecting them, for they shall hope for eternal life, and that they may live, each of them, 500 years. And so after the flood, whereas the, the uh, children of humanity, whereas humanity had even lived for a thousand years, uh, the statures, because humans um, before them were also of what would be considered gigantic stature uh, and giants, considered to be giants, uh, according to the stature of humanity now. But um, the humanity was reduced in stature, and their lifespans also reduced from a 1,000 years to 120. And so after Noah, uh, like by the time of Abraham, Abraham lived to 175 years. And then it, his, you know, the lifespan of humanity continued to reduce until it was around 120 years. Whereas the giants, after the flood, they would also be reduced in stature, and their lifespans would no longer be seemingly immortal, but would be reduced to 500 years. And so after Og of Bashan, because he was the last remnant giant spared from the flood by Noah himself, um, the giants that were born unto him because he married into the the line of Ham. He took a wife of the Canaanites that lived in uh, what is now known as Israel. Um, it is from his conception, his conceiving with the, uh, with the children of Canaan or the Canaanites that led to the later birth of Goliath and Saf, Ish ben Bob, uh, the four brothers of Goliath, and the other giants. They were also, because there were numerous, those that were in Sodom and Gomorrah were also uh, born from Og's relationship with the, whether it was one or many Canaanite women, we don't know, but um, that was the, he was the reason why the giants were became numerous after the flood. All right, continuing with this story. To Michael, likewise, the Lord said, Go and announce his crime to Semyaza and to the others who are with him who have been associated with women, that they might be polluted with all their impurity. And when all their sons shall be slain, when they shall see the perdition of their beloved, bind them for 70 generations underneath the earth, even to the day of judgment and of consummation until the judgment, the effect of which will last forever be completed. 
Then shall they be taken away into the lowest depths of the fire. In torments and in confinement shall they be shut up forever. Immediately after this shall he, together with them, burn and perish. They shall be bound until the consummation of many generations. Destroy all the souls addicted to dalliance and the offspring of the watchers, for they have tyrannized over mankind. Let every oppressor perish from the face of the earth. Let every evil work be destroyed. The plant of righteousness and of rectitude appear, and its produce become a blessing. Righteousness and rectitude shall be forever planted with the light. And then shall all the saints give thanks and live until they have begotten a thousand children, while the whole period of their youth and their Sabbath shall be completed in peace. In those days all the earth shall be cultivated in righteousness. It shall be wholly planted with trees and filled with benediction. Every tree of delight shall be planted in it. In it shall vines be planted and the vine which shall be planted in it shall yield fruit to satiety. Every seed which shall be sown in it shall produce for one measure a thousand and one measure of olives shall produce ten presses of oil. All right, I'm going to stop there. Um, but you can see how it talks about you know, the the millennial reign as well. And it's interesting to mention that it says that uh, those that would be born or alive at that time, uh, perhaps humanity, uh, those that w are remaining of humanity, of the elect, of the righteous, that uh, says that they will have a thousand children and that their lives will be completed in peace. So very interesting. Whether this be the resurrected, you know, those of the elect that, because our bodies are to be re resurrected at the end of days. Uh, who knows? But it's also interesting that um, in Matthew it says that Yeshua said that we are not given in marriage. As angels, we are not given in marriage. And so to me, that means that when we return to our first estate, um, that we will no longer involve ourselves in procreation. And so is there going to be another cycle of humanity and that those that are counted among the elect that receive their crowns of glory, as it speaks about in the Ascension of Isaiah, will we um, become, and you know, I pray that I myself and all of you are included uh, in a a restoration of our bright natures because um, many of the texts speak about that, how when we are returned to our first estate, uh, we will be, we will again be immortal and be restored to our bright nature, which is the angelic nature of Adam and Eve prior to their transformation into flesh and their banishment here to the earth. And so, um, perhaps there is another cycle of humanity um, which is to come and that uh, maybe we being restored to our angelic bright nature uh, that we become the next generation of messengers um, to the people of humanity. Perhaps the those that weren't that fell short um, perhaps they will be given a chance again or those that are alive during that time you know um, maybe humanity will continue in some way and that once the earth is restored uh, because there's going to be a destruction of the earth as spoken of you know by fire and spoken of in Second Peter as well as the revelation of St. John the Theologian, which is one of my favorite texts and um, gives great detail on the end of days and um, it elaborates without 
having to, uh, you know, for those that want to read it, it speaks about the occurrences and the uh, the events of Revelation without placing them in parable form. So you don't have to understand the scriptures and the secrets contained therein to make sense of what's going to happen at the end of days. It just lays it out. Um, and so it's an interesting text to to study. Let me go ahead and place that for you in the chat room so you have, can have the link. I love this text so much that, as I stated before, I include it in the very end of my fourth book, Lucifer, Father of Cain. And I do recommend people read it for themselves. It gives, uh, it gives a very interesting parallel to what, you know, is is in Revelation at the very end of the New Testament. All right. Going to question Link asks, do you know anything about those who were conceived by it just moved. Conceived by Adam and Eve before the fall who are still in paradise? Um, there were no children conceived by Adam and Eve until they were placed in the flesh. And so there's no children waiting for them in paradise. It wasn't until they were banished here to the earth and their spirits were married to, you know, the their dust fallen forms, um, that that children were born unto them. As I was talking about in that other um, in that story that I was elaborating on. It wasn't until Adam and Eve were placed here in the cave of treasures and placed in bodies of flesh, even though they did eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, I, I elaborate on this story as well because there's two different accounts. Um, of their eating fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And this is m what you must be speaking about, Link. In my sixth book, Sons of God, I talk about how their eating of this tree in paradise, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it caused them to lose their immortal bright nature. And it caused them to have to die. Meaning that... Um, they were going to lose their angelic natures. And it was, they ate from this tree wanting to be as gods themselves. And so when they did, they were banished from paradise. And on the eighth day, they were entered into the flesh form. They were placed into the flesh bodies. They were transformed into flesh. And uh, if you want to know more about this story, um, I, I elaborate on this as well in my fourth book, Lucifer, Father of Cain, where I talk about the difference between paradise and the Garden of Eden, as well as um, their state before the fall. And how it was that, because um, it talks about this in the first book of Adam and Eve, how when they were first placed here in the wilderness of the earth, they did not even understand how to walk because they were able to float um, and they were able to propel themselves by projecting their will, their intent forward, and that's how they move, just like we do in dreams, but that when they were placed in the flesh form, they had to walk. And also, they were unaccustomed to light, um, like the sun's rays and the heat frightened them. And the brightness of its coming, they thought it was a monster that had come to devour them. Uh, because 
they were cast out and they were placed here. Uh, and then the sun went down and darkness, they did not understand darkness either. And the darkness frightened them. But an angel was sent by Yeshua to explain to them that there would be 12 hours of darkness and 12 hours of um, of night, which again means that they were placed here on the vernal equinox. I, in my opinion, it was the vernal equinox and not the autumnal equinox, because it's also the vernal equinox which begins the day, um, the the first day and the first season according to God's calendar, which I explain all of this in my new book, which I'm good, I'm close to being done with, so I'll release it soon, and I'll, you know, release what it is all about as well. Because I'm still keeping that from you for just a little bit more time. But uh, also, they did not understand hunger or thirst. And... You know, because, the, again, in paradise, they did not have bodies of flesh. But once they were placed here, banished here to the earth, then they had all of the physical characteristics that we share with them, their need to sleep, their need to eat, their need to drink, uh, all of these things. All right. And so I, I hope I hope that that helps you as well. Also know that it's in September um, that the uh, Sukkot, the festival of weeks, takes place, and the Day of Atonement, as well as the uh, Feast of Tabernacles. All of these are coming up. Um, and so people might, you know, just want to acknowledge the Most High on those particular days. Uh, also, I'm going to be, every time I do a show here on Saturday, I'm going to announce when, uh, where we are as far as God's calendar and when the Sabbath is as well as when the New Moon Day is. Um, so that people can know when the Sabbath really is and then honor it in that way as well. And so um, I will do that. Also know that if you're looking up the the phases of the moon, that you have to realize that the new moon day, which begins and is the first day and first Sabbath on God's calendar, that what science calls the new moon day is not, is actually lunar conjunction on God's calendar. And so you have to be aware of this. Let me see. tell you where we are in just a minute. And so, um, the full moon is the 2nd of July. And then seven days after... would be the ninth, would be the third quarter, and then conjunction. Uh, on the 16th, they call, um, science calls this the day of the new moon. But this is actually lunar conjunction. On God's calendar, new moon day, or what they call the Kadesh, the time of the new moon, it is actually when the moon is 7% full. And that occurs on the 19th. So on the 19th of July will be the first day and first Sabbath according to God's calendar. Uh, 
and that the fourth Sabbath will occur on the twelfth. And so, hold on. Ah, actually, strangely enough, um, the Sabbaths are in this month on the... Hold on, let me may verify this before I say... The full moon here is on the second... Ninth conjunction would be on the 16th. And so it looks like on the 22nd. Anyways, let me determine this um, precisely before I announce, but it looks like that the Sabbaths are on Thursday this month, if I'm correct. And so anyways, I do appreciate all of you. I hope that this show helped um, in you know, helping you to understand the the two incursions and how all of that unfolded. Again, as I said, um, and this is really important to understand that the new moon as science, what science calls the new moon is actually the lunar conjunction and that the lunar conjunction is the last day as well as the last Sabbath on those days which um, have 29 days. But, you know, because the synodic month, the four phases of the moon, average 29 and a half, 29.53 days, uh, God's calendar alternates between 29 and 30 days every other month. And so on the months where the, the lunar calendar only has 29 days, the 29th day would be the fifth Sabbath. There's always five Sabbaths to every month on God's calendar. And then the following day, the new moon day is also a Sabbath. Um, but on the days where there's 30 days, the, there, the lunar conjunction would be the 29th. There would be one day in between. And then the first would be, you know, again, the Kodesh or the new moon and that would be the first Sabbath, and then there would be six work days. And then on the first quarter moon, near the first quarter moon, uh, would be the second Sabbath. And then there's six more days in the third Sabbath, six more days in the fourth Sabbath, six more days in the fifth Sabbath. And then, again, usually um, the, the alternating month, the 29th day, um, if, if that's the fifth Sabbath, then the next day. All right. And so anyways, my next book details all of this in great, great detail and helps you to understand all of what I'm talking about. And it will help you to know when the Sabbaths actually fall, when they occur, so that you can keep up with honoring the fourth commandment, uh, as well as, you know, not following the Gregorian solar calendar. It has um, links to idolatry and taking other gods before us. And so, God bless all of you. I'll be doing a show again this coming up Wednesday, Cairo. God bless all. May you be blessed and may the Most High watch over you, keep you all safe, uh, keep you all blessed. Hello, Watcher Ruth and Opal and Jackson and Heaven and uh, Sunway and all the other guests, Cairo and
link, Olive Tree. I, I appreciate all of you, and uh, I hope that the show blessed you. And um, in Yeshua and Yahuwah's name. All right, 10 seconds. So We'll see you Wednesday. It uh, should be a good show. Good night, all. God bless.